Well, anyway, Mike, I guess I'll hand it over to you. Okay, and, and thank you uh, very much for uh, for the opportunity, Sandy and, and uh, Horse Council. And thanks for, to everybody for, for coming out uh, or sitting in or as, as the case is. Uh, we're all getting very used to doing these Zoom meetings. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's killing my air miles, but, it, but I, I, I must admit it's, uh, it's become very efficient for all of us, I think, to be able to sort of have these um, planned meetings and in some cases impromptu meetings uh, to, to do a bit of um, interaction and communication with, with clients. Um, so uh, I, in, in general terms, I mean, I was asked to sort of speak about uh, risk associated with organizing a horse show or being a participant, not a participant, but an official or, or someone who's responsible for the event. And, and that's a fairly uh, topical uh, issue, um, even though this year um, we didn't have competitions, certainly not in the way that we were used to. And um, to Sandy's point, I hope that next year is a very different environment where uh, those that choose to compete can do so, uh, hopefully under the sanctions that are available uh, from EC or from Horse Council uh, to, uh, to run safe and, and uh, good events so that we get uh, sort of back into a rhythm of participation. Um, I've said so often this year that I don't think that we're going back to anything. I think we're going forward to something that is new that may look slightly different from what it once was, but I have every confidence that the horse industry is resilient as was proven this year. And uh, the next year will in fact be a better year. So with that all being said as a bit of an intro, let's talk a little bit about just the broader risk associated with organizing an event. And uh, it suffice to say that, that as, as the host, as the organizer of the event, you are taking an enormous responsibility uh, uh, for people's safety, uh, for how things will run when you invite people to a premises. Uh, it's no different for a coach asking students to come to their place of business to take riding lessons. It's just a different exposure. It's, it's nonetheless an organizer, or a host who's in control of a land mass, inviting people to come to the, to the land to participate either as competitors or uh, as spectators or as service providers to those that might be on site. And by virtue of that, it is taking a pretty significant responsibility on and, and certainly is exposed to liability that could be assessed against them should anyone become injured or if property is damaged uh, during the course of the event. So needless to say, the, one of the many ways that you can protect yourself is to acquire an insurance policy that is designed specifically for that organization and operation of an event. Uh, commercial general liability insurance is the technical term. We sell it, others do as well. This is not unique to Capri CMW and, and it's, uh, it's one that frankly horse show sanction or, or uh, folks that provide sanction EC or horse council or others demand of their hosts to obtain and maintain for the course of the, through the course of the event. Um, I guess what I would also say just as a, as a matter of priority is that the host is at the pointy end of the stick. So really, no matter what else happens down the triangle, if there is a claim or if there is an incident, ultimately the guy at the pointy end of the stick is also is going to be named as the defendant or the person responsible, even though there may be others to share the responsibility down the food chain. But at the end of a long day, uh, stuff does move upstream in this particular case and the show organizer is always going to be held uh, responsible, at least in part, if not in full for things that occur at the event where they have invited folks to come. So we often get asked about limits of insurance and how much is enough and all the rest of it. And I'll give you a couple of examples. We, um, we provide automatically $5 million on most of our policies, as you all know, as members of Horse Council. And if you're a coach, you know that our program is, is, is predominantly a $5 million program. We've chosen 5 million as sort of the standard in our business and have done so frankly since I've been involved, which is 1997, so to almost 23 years. And, and it's, it's just, it's, it's become sort of the norm in our sport. There's still lots of coverages out there for 2 million. Um, I'm pretty sure, in fact, I know certainly that the EC, when uh, Equestrian Canada sanctions an event, they only require 2 million. And that's to facilitate a, a broader market so that folks that don't choose to do business with us or, or others can still acquire insurance that's affordable. We think ours is affordable too. I think it's great value for what we do, but, uh, but nonetheless. So in, in terms of pro, uh, context, in my 23 years, now almost uh, 24 years almost, 
I can tell you with some certainty that I've never seen a claim near 5 million. Um, our worst catastrophe sort of claims are, are those that involve uh, catastrophic permanent injuries to, to young people. And uh, those un unfortunately can, can sort of generate very significant loss settlements because of the uh, severity of the injury and uh, the fact that long-term care may be a part of the, the settlement. Um, and, uh, but frankly, in, in my experience, certainly in this sport in Canada and over my, my long career, I've not seen one get over anywhere close to, to 5 million. I have seen them go well over 2 million. So that's perhaps just a frame of reference as you move forward. And it's not discipline specific. We can have equally as catastrophic injuries or catastrophic incidents at a dressage show or a seemingly innocent type of event as we can on cross country or, or some other thing that would uh, at, at first glance seem to be much riskier. Uh, the, the general risk is still putting people and horses together in various environments and horses being a thousand pounds and people not typically being that weight, uh, bad stuff can happen. And uh, frankly, the, the frequency of claims that we see are uh, almost certainly uh, not in the ring. Um, it's quite interesting to me that one of the safest places on the show ground is in fact in the competition ring where rules and, and, and smaller groups, but potentially only one rider, one horse are, are actively participating or doing whatever it is they're doing. Where we see most claims at horse shows, frankly, is in the parking lot, if that makes any sense. Um, I can't tell you the number of times I've taken calls from folks who um, have horses running amok at their, at their parking, in their parking lot, causing all kinds of havoc. Uh, folks that tie their horses to trailers and then go and have lunch and forget about their horse. Uh, all kinds of things that in hindsight are always very easy to say, gee, well, I wish I hadn't done that. or wish they hadn't done that. But frankly, are, are all too often uh, things that do occur. Uh, horses and cars don't mix well, as we've learned when uh, they start doing sort of a ricochet off, off park vehicles or running over people and babies and strollers and all manner of things that horses can do. So those are things that are very real risks to us. So I often stress to organizers that frankly, they should be paying at least as much attention to how they manage that congregation of trucks and trailers and people and people movement away from, away from the, show, uh, the show ring itself, because frankly, that's where people forget that a lot of stuff and a lot of activity occurs and uh, where there's that increase in activity, invariably we see increase in claims. To my point a second ago, in the actual ring, and now we're getting to the officials, which I know is predominantly why, why folks are on the call, we're, we're in an environment that is governed by rules that have some sort of structure that the, the, in theory, the jumps are spaced a certain number of meters apart to allow for safe passage down the line or where there are obstacles in other disciplines that are laid out according to a rule book for consistency and fair play. Uh, those things are environments that are predictable, uh, that in theory, the participants are prepared to engage in. There's no surprises in theory. And so those environments become by their very definition a safer place to be. Uh, congregation at the in-gate, I'm using that word too much today, but congregation at an in-gate is also a problem area for us uh, where we've got in-gates uh, they become crowded and announcers saying, you know, Mike, you're three away, you're two away, you're one away, and people are starting to move towards the ring, and maybe there's a delay in the ring, and they forget to tell those five riders that they shouldn't come yet, and or in the warm-up area where I've got people frantically trying to prepare for their, their 50 seconds of fame and fortune in the ring. Um, those are the areas that, 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 frankly, are probably the biggest problem areas for us, and undoubtedly the biggest problem areas for stewards and officials. Nice segue. Um, so to their responsibilities, I say I tip my hat because I know you have to have eyes literally uh, uh, you know, re in every direction all 100% of the time at the event to fulfill your obligations as that person in charge to make sure that folks are doing what they're supposed to do in accordance with the rules, that they're not wrapping their horses or jumping oxers backwards or uh, riding without their helmet or, uh, or any number of things that would be constituted unfair play or uh, unfair practice or unsafe practices uh, to make sure that grandma and grandpa who are, who are setting the courses are doing so accordance to some standard. Um, I know certainly the carded officials, those that are carded by EC have some restrictions on their activities. They're not in theory supposed to uh, officiate at, at, at events that are not EC sanctioned. And there are other jurisdictional rules that apply to many coaches and or, excuse me, many officials uh, and there's a reason for that. It's about consistency. It's about making sure that those 
services are provided in a consistent way across the industry. There's always going to be an argument about whether or not there's enough horse shows for officials to make a living and they should be allowed to officiate at other types of events that follow same guidance. And I won't go there, that's, that's really a, a matter not for us to decide. Suffice to say that when we provide coverage to an official, that we're providing coverage for their official duties, whatever those things may be. We don't define what those duties are. We assume by virtue of the application that they are qualified to be an official, that they are qualified to be a steward, that they have uh, taken some training to allow them to be, um, uh, that would encourage their clients to invite them to the premises to do those, those jobs that they do. Um, so that there's, there's some assumptions there. Um, um, so so uh, we provide a broad-based coverage that doesn't govern particularly one site or, or any number of shows or even discipline. Uh, if someone needs officials coverage, we, we go through a questionnaire, period, a questionnaire and as soon as, assuming they answer all the questions, they can have the coverage. Uh, coverage is provided worldwide so that for those coaches that do officiate, or excuse me, those coaches, those officials that officiate abroad, they're, they're certainly protected as well in those other jurisdictions. Um, one question we get uh, quite a lot is, if the organizer buys an insurance policy to cover the event, does it cover officials? And the answer from us at least, if we provide that coverage to a horse show is yes, that the uh, insurer uh, and us as underwriters um, recognize that there are many people that make the show run, uh, that volunteers frankly are, are the, the spine of the, the backbone of, of many horse shows people that help people park and help people go to where they need to go and uh, do the things that need to be done, run the secretary's booth, the show secretary's booth, hand out ribbons, do jump crews, all those things. They might be paid employees of the event host, but frankly, in many cases, certainly in my experience when I was horse showing, a lot of those, uh, those jobs were done by volunteers. So the policy names the show host, the organizer, would typically also name the landowner or recognize the landowner as being an additional insured but then goes on to cover employees and officials and judges and others who help the, 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 the event run. And uh, it's when they're acting in that official capacity uh, as a contributor to the event that they are covered by this policy that would be issued to the show, which is obviously specific because it will have a beginning and an end. It'll start Thursday at midnight and then Monday afternoon, whatever the dates are that are on the show organizers policy. Um, that's when the coverage is extended to these other uh, folks and these other uh, uh, people at the event. Um, question we also receive often is, if I'm a member of Horse Council or any of the other PTSOs and I have $5 million of personal liability insurance, will it protect me in my official duties as, a, as an official? Answer is no, you're getting paid to provide a service. Uh, the personal liability insurance that is provided to you as a member of the PTSO is not relevant to your uh, operations as a judge or as an official. It has to do with your ownership of a horse. Uh, so it is, it is uh, specific to those exposures. And so it's important for all people that are offering their services to others or accepting uh, a fee for services to be provided. They need to make certain that they have insurance to protect themselves. It's either through uh, acquisition of a policy in their own name or confirming with the show host that the policy does in fact extend to them as an additional insured uh, so that they are protected in their duties. I talked about the food chain before about the pointy stick being the show host, being somebody that's invariably going to be named in a, in a, a lawsuit if there's a bodily injury claim in the ring or in the parking lot or wherever. And it's fair to say that if it has anything to do with rules or the application of rules or about obstacles that may have been on course that were not to snuff or perceived not to have been up to snuff, then undoubtedly the steward or, or some other official will also be named as a co-defendant. Uh, we've seen suits, uh, bodily injury claims, uh, one quite famously in British Columbia where a woman fell off a, over a three-day event fence and there were no less than 14 separate defendants in the action that was launched by her family uh, in an effort to become indemnified for the injury sustained. So every official, whether they were present or not was named, the sanctioning body was named, the landowners were named. Uh, it, it went on and on and on. And it wasn't until sometime later that the court sort of narrowed that field to determine who was actually responsible for the injury uh, and ultimately how settlements would be, would be uh, doled out. Uh, but at the outset, of course, all of those 14 defendants 
uh, had to rely upon an insurance policy or several policies, in fact, to provide a defense. Uh, because that, of course, is one of the uh, most significant features of having this type of insurance in place. It's not just about whether a court finds you guilty. It's about the process to get you to that point where a court may make that determination. Those defense costs, frankly, are very often enormous. And uh, uh, in many cases, again, in my experience, they exceed the settlement amounts. Uh, I've seen many liability claims where defense costs can be hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, leading up to a, a, a ultimately a court case, only to have the insurance company finally find a way to settle the loss before it gets into a court of law. And I assure you that no insuring company wants to go to court, uh, not for any other reason than as much as we, we all uh, assume that the jury is a, is a, a, a group of people that, are, uh, that have a thorough understanding of the nuance of any circumstance, in our case of horses, that's typically not the case. And uh, they're human beings, they do a very huge, significant service to the community by being on a jury, but very often will be very sympathetic and empathetic to a victim or someone who, who uh, purports to have an injury quite often at the expense of the insurance companies who are all perceived as being unlimited deep pockets, which is simply not true. But the reality is they would much prefer as an insuring industry, if they can find a way to settle out, they will. They'll do their very best to do it to try and reduce some of their costs for defense and ultimately for settlements that might be very prejudicial or in their minds prejudicial in a court. Uh, so the value of the insurance can very often be realized very quickly when we think about an official's or a judge's policy that we might sell for 150 or $200, providing $5 million of, of coverage if there was an enormous settlement in a court of law and perhaps hundreds of thousands of defense costs that the defendant might have to incur before a settlement is even reached. Uh, it seems like a pretty good value for 150 or 200 bucks. So uh, let's see, a uh, question that has come up uh, before is, if an incident does occur, what are the duties of the official to report uh, the incident? And I would say that the, the duty to report to their insurer, if they are insured separately, uh, does occur when someone is injured and needs to be hauled off in an ambulance. We say the same sort of things to coaches. We prefer to be advised of incidents that involve bodily injury quite quickly. We don't want to wait. Uh, people have two years to launch an action, and if it's a minor, even longer. And uh, we want to make sure that if there is an incident that seems very innocent at the, innocent at the time, but has any notion of there being a big significant issue down the road, that the insurer is advised. Uh, they hire some very, very smart people to reach out to the claimant or uh, potentially the claimant's family to say, hey, you know, how's Jocelyn doing? And, you know, I represent the insuring company uh, that is providing coverage to the host or the show organizer or indeed the official. We'd like you to know uh, who we are uh, and our approach to these things and to, to try and gather as much information as possible so that in the event that something does go awry down the road, there's been that initial contact, which very often can be uh, more clear than uh, the memory of an incident a, a year hence uh, after lawyers have become involved. And nothing against the legal profession, everybody has a, has a job to do, uh, but uh, very often these claims are quite embellished when they're finally presented to insurers and now they're scrambling back in time trying to find out details. So incident reports are very, very important. I know officials and judges have that obligation when they're uh, at events and they should be documented very cl clearly and accurately. And if a bodily injury situation arises or even a property damage claim arises or incident arises that looks like it may become significant, it should be reported. It doesn't change the rates in future years. It's really just a case of making sure the insuring company is advised of the potential for a claim to come for that might come forward in the future. Um, so uh, I'm just looking at my notes here, guys. I apologize. I, 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 was, I was supposed to have a PowerPoint and I didn't get it done. So I apologize for that. Um, so volunteer work on listed coverage, ring crew and volunteers. I've kind of addressed that. I mean, I would say to you that if the show organizer's policy is broad enough in scope and written correctly, that all of those individuals that are representing the show organizer in a volunteer capacity are protected typically by the policy. But it's up to them, frankly, as volunteers to make sure that that is the case, that the host is actually extending coverage to them so that they can be sure that they are protected while they're at the show. Um, so listen, I'll, I'll stop. And I know I've sort of speed talked as sort of my nature. Um, 
I'm hoping there's some questions and we can let this conversation sort of deviate however you'd like it to go. So I'll turn this back to uh, Jocelyn or Sam, I'm not sure who's taking the questions. And uh, why don't we start having a conversation? Okay, um, so Linda has a question in the chat that says, are there specific HCBC forms to fill out or fill in to start the process? I believe of a claim. Of a claim? Well, there are yeah. incident reporting forms, uh, which I can happily give to you, Jocelyn or Sandy, um, whoever that we use in our programming. Um, and frankly, there's the same incident reporting forms that coaches would use. Uh, uh, when they report an incident to us. And um, uh, I can certainly have those sent to Horse Council in a heartbeat. Uh, and officials are more than welcome to, to use them. You know, there's that old adage about the, the weakest ink is better than the, the strongest memory. And we think that that's true. Um, so uh, writing things down is a very important element of, of, of risk management to, uh, to see what we can to uh, try and mitigate losses down the road. Okay, and then I had another question emailed earlier. Um, are we as judges required to have up-to-date St. John's ambulance training to be insured? Um, it, it, I did get that question earlier and I, and I apologize, I should have answered that in my little dissertation there. Um, the, the answer is I would, I would hope <laughs> that stewards and officials do have first aid training. Uh, it's not a requirement um, in terms of, it's not, in, in other words, it's not a condition of insurance. Um, and as I understand, frankly, I was speaking to EC about some other things today, and it's not even a, a requirement there, which sort of surprised me. Um, I would have thought that a steward or an official who is responsible for so much of the environment in which, in which a competition occurs would, would necessarily have some first aid training uh, so that they might be able to step in if, if, if asked to do so. Uh, but that being said, I mean, the, the default has been uh, paramedics or other medical personnel as being part of that, that structure of an event, uh, which is not the official's job. And uh, I would also uh, respect the fact that officials have a lot of other stuff to worry about. Uh, so, uh, you know, really to add the burden of uh, a first aid uh, would, be, would be challenging. But to answer the question, the answer is no, it's not a requirement. It's, it's probably an encouragement just to make sure that uh, an official is prepared for any unforeseen circumstances to the best of their ability. As long as the show organizers are not relying upon them to be the first aid first responder, then I would say it's just a backup sort of situation. Here's something else that I will throw out just to, uh, which is sort of related to health and so on. Of course, we're all talking about COVID now. It's become so much ingrained in us. And um, I know that certainly stewards and officials were very concerned, probably still are, and undoubtedly will still need to be very concerned next year with respect to how they manage the COVID environment at the event and whether or not that duty to make sure that people are social distancing and wearing masks and how many people are in a, in a gathering and so forth, is that really the steward's responsibility or is that the show organizer's responsibility? We've had lots of discussions with both show organizers and officials during this 2020 year, although horse shows never, didn't really uh, come to fruition in most locations. And, and uh, the, the answer to that was typically that the host is, is ultimately responsible, it seems to me. I think the official can be tasked with trying to assist in that and certainly help the show host police that. But our, our guidance, frankly, throughout the summer months as horse shows were still being considered was that show organizers should actually be a, a, um, appointing uh, or, or assigning uh, a COVID police, if you will, or a COVID official uh, at site and to be easily identified as being the person that's responsible for COVID compliance or COVID uh, uh, regulation compliance um, to make sure that people weren't doing the things that we all love to do and that's socialized and uh, making sure that traffic flows of people, animals, and, and so forth were being done in a way that was consistent with what the health uh, officials were telling us to do. Um, I expect, again, that in 2021, as much as we're all sitting on the edge of our chairs waiting for these vaccines to become available and widely distributed, it's fair to say that by any account that I've read, to date at least, um, it's probably a year before there's sufficient herd uh, vaccine is sort of out there that all of us in, in the population will have 
been given an opportunity, if not been mandated, to uh, to get the vaccination before things can get back to sort of you know gathering in large groups and all the rest of it. So I don't think we're out of this yet, and I think officials are going to be tasked with at least contributing to that conversation as the person or persons in charge, along with the host, to make sure that people remain safe and remain somewhat as compliant as they possibly can with health and government uh, guidance. Okay, another question, a couple questions here. Um, what specific site precautions are recommended for organizers, i.e. things like gates closed to roadways, first aid kits on site, signs? Are there things you see claims for like more often? Sure, and, and, and again, I sort of made that story about the parking lots, but it's not, it's not really a story, nor is it, nor is it um, uh, to be minimized. Um, I, uh, I've run horse shows. I've certainly attended lots of horse shows as a competition, but we ran horse shows in my day uh, as a younger person, and, and um, I can remember the struggles of trying to accommodate massive rigs uh, on our property, uh, you know, often in muddy fields. It happens everywhere tractors needed to be pulling trucks and trailers where they needed to go and either on arrival or, or else uh, when they're leaving. Signage is critically important, telling people where they can go and where they can't go. Having any kind of a barrier, snow fence barrier, even tape to say, don't go beyond this, this line. Uh, this is private property. In many cases, we can't, you can't go in the barn when you're at the horse show. You stay where spectators are supposed to go and you stay the hell out of my, my barn or out of my, my other area. Um, but I, I think the bottom line here is, and this is always the challenge, it's making sure that you've got enough volunteers that have had a meeting, at least a couple of meetings before the event to understand what the responsibilities are and then to assign them very specific responsibilities about being, who is it that calls 911? It should be one person. Every one of the volunteers at the event should know that it's, it's Sandy Underwood that calls 911. It's not Linda, it's not Jocelyn, it's not Mike, it's Sandy. And they've got to know how to get out. They've got to be able to, if they see something that requires Sandy's attention as the first responder to get the first responder, as it were, they've got to know how to do that. So important, guys, having some sort of identification. You know, there's all these fabulous fluorescent vests that are available everywhere now. It doesn't take very much to put your horse show name across or to say volunteer in charge or whatever the, the, the designation you want to do or a bright pink hat or some other identifier. So the spectators, competitors, and others who are on site know to go to that individual if they have a question. Those are really important risk management tools, guys, and they're not hard to do. Um, and, and frankly, it helps run the show much more cohesively if people that are visiting the site potentially for the first time know who the hell it is they have to ask. My biggest fear is when we have people, uh, uh, again, congregating, there's that word again, around the show secretary's booth. Uh, we've had claims where, you know, somebody stuck their head inside the trailer while they're holding the reins on their horse, trying to go au concours on the class that's going to go in three minutes. You know, well, it's, it's just an accident waiting to happen. First of all, what the hell is the horse doing at the show secretary's booth at all? But more importantly, what the, what the show secretary can't control is who else is outside. And imagine, you know, the, Mrs. Smith and her child going to the, the, uh, the bleachers or something, and she has to walk by the, the show secretary's booth, and here's a horse that's in its way. Doesn't know how to manage that environment, nor should they be expected to. So understanding traffic flow of people, understanding traffic flow of, of horses, and, uh, and of trucks and trailers and equipment that have to be on site is critically important in doing dry runs. Uh, I've been on jump crews at the Royal Winter Fair, and I want to, I want to tell you, you practice those, those courses a, a bunch of times, and you, so that they happen just like this, it goes off like clockwork for a reason. Guys aren't standing around waiting to be told what to do. They know what to do. Same thing applies at any event, anywhere. Gotta have enough volunteers to make it work or it's not gonna work well. Okay, um, another question. Do, does the official's insurance cover the official at a non-sanctioned event, like, or one with no rules? <laughs> no rules? Well, quote, brackets, no rules. Yeah. Um, Again, uh, we provide coverage to uh, officials uh, for their duties as officials. We assume that the officials are uh, in their duties uh, uh, following the rules that have been set out by the host. Um, I recognize that there are sanctioned and unsanctioned events. 
I recognize that uh, in theory, all of those events need officials to at the very least judge a class or to, um, to do those things. Um, do I encourage that? Absolutely not. Um, uh, the, a rule book is actually a bit of a, of a defense mechanism. It becomes a risk management tool for the official. If the official can demonstrate, if, assuming they're named in a, in a lawsuit, if they can uh, demonstrate that they were following the rules that are published, that are widely used in the community, uh, regardless of discipline, then frankly, it becomes a much more robust defense than uh, a claim where there are no rules. Um, I get very concerned as, a, as an insurance person and certainly would have been equally as concerned uh, by, uh, as a competitor, uh, if there were no rules that allowed for fair play and, and for my horse and me to be safe at the site and uh, under duress in that competitive environment. Uh, but to answer the question, there's no specific condition of coverage in my program that says that only those shows that have EC rules or horse council rules are covered. That's simply not true. Okay, um, and then are you covered as an official at a permitted show licensed by horse council? Well, yeah, the answer is yeah, you are. Okay. Perfect, and then uh, Melanie had two questions. So Melanie, do you wanna unmute and ask them or if you wanna type yeah. them, I can. Yeah, uh, no, that's great. Thank you very much. And um, can you hear me okay? Uh, so I actually now I have three questions, but I promise they're quite quick. So um, where is, is there a form for us to fill in to get judges, for us judges to get insurance? Oh, sure. Yeah, there's an application, Melanie. We can, we can send it to you. Send us an email. And, and okay, I'll so I just, send it yeah. okay, I just sent an email to get it. Yeah. Okay, I have another question. Um, and it's based on some insurance um, that I had from you before that cost $250 and I had to have my St. John's ambulance and I can't remember why we got to that point. It's probably but coaches I, insurance. Well, but I've never been a coach. And so I, I can't, I'm not gonna go into my memory. It's not reliable, no. but, but it did make me think of this question. And that is that we do, I can't remember what we call them, but we do judge teach judge clinics. So we judge and then we go out and we teach the competitor, <clears throat> excuse me for 10 minutes and then we judge again. Now that's putting us a little bit in a coach's position. Right. So, what about that? I want you to have first aid. So, if, so if we're doing that first aid, we're still covered yeah. as a, as a official. Yeah, and, first aid. and and it just makes sense, and I'm sure you agree, Melanie. I mean, the fact is now you're in a, you're you're very much in a control environment. You're in control, <laughs> yeah. so it makes sense to me that if you're instructing me as a rider to do something that you would you know that you eventually will judge based on your instruction to say. Okay, if you do these things this way, you will be judged higher. I presume that's the sort of the environment. Uh, this is not about winning an award as much as it is learning how to compete more effectively, yeah. according from a judge's view. Am I right? So yeah. nonetheless, you're providing instruction. You're now a clinician effectively. So I would fully expect you to have first aid. Okay, and that's- and, and if that's the case, if that was the case previously, that's why you're asked to do it. Okay, thank you. And, and that's, I think that was an important point for all of us. Um, my last question, I promise it is the last. So my husband um, doesn't ride um, and we get him horse council insurance every year because he helps me. But he's also, bless his heart, usually the grounds manager for the big Victoria Dressage show every year. And it has never occurred to us to get extra insurance for him as grounds manager. Should yeah. we be doing that? We've just assumed he was covered by the show, but possibly And he probably is. But he probably is, Melanie. And, and again, it's a very simple question to ask the show organizers to say, hey, is, 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 is Mr. Houston covered by the policy as groundsman as he volunteers his, his time and, and energy for this event every year? If there were an incident arising from his work, whatever that work is in groundsman capacity, would he be protected by the show policy? That's a very simple question to get asked and answered. And the answer well, yeah. should be categorically yes. Yes, but... He is actually a lawyer too. And your original point was that, uh, you know, if somebody has a terrible accident, they're going to go after everybody. Yep. So they're going to go after the show, but they're also going to go after him as the show manager. There will be a separate claim against him. So It'll he has... So, so, so he has his just personal horse counts insurance. He's covered by the show, but who, should he take out a third insurance as the grounds manager for that show? Not in a volunteer capacity, I would say not. It, 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 as groundsman, 
he is acting in an official capacity on behalf of the host. To wit, if he were named as a defendant, first of all, highly unlikely, I can't even imagine a circumstance where he would be independent of the show, because that's not the strategy that would be used by opposing counsel. If they're going to cast a net, it's, it's a single claim. There may be separate defendants, but it's a single claim. So in this, in this example, your husband absolutely would be able to rely upon full defense separately and severally, in his name separately and severally, as an additional insured automatically covered by the show policy. It's no different than any commercial policy. And I'll use this example. Capri CMW Insurance Brokers Limited is an incorporated entity. We have 450 employees. Each one of them separately and severally would be defended in a lawsuit. I'm trying to imagine an environment where that might occur in our, in our space, a slip and fall. I don't know. The, the branch in Penticton suffers, somebody comes in, slips and falls. And the claimant decides that they're gonna sue the corporation but they're also going to sue the employee. It may, maybe they're, or if we're doing a charitable event, we've got volunteers and spouses, frankly, show up at those things very often to help us. They're all covered by the policy automatically. We don't have to name them. We don't have to do anything. So again, to the original question, simple question to be asked, simple answer to be had by your husband to the show organizer. In my capacity as show, as show organizer, show uh, manager, am I protected by this policy if anything occurs where my name appears on a lawsuit? Answer should be categorically yes. He does not need other insurance. It's not his vocation. It's not what he does. He's volunteering. But um, are we correct in thinking the fact that he's regularly on show grounds and helping me that he should be insured or we should, do we not need to be insuring no. him? No, I don't think you have to insure him separately. That, that would be my recommendation. I, I don't see the need for it. Okay. Great. <laughs> no, I, I don't. I, I think you're going to be protected. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, another question here, do people have to be named individually on a policy or can you just name the position? Well, no, I just, I said to Melanie, so, so very often what a, what a policy will read is there'll be a definition actually in the policy wording that says named insured and I'll say named insured is, and it will, it will speak to landowners. It will speak to the organizer. It will stay volunteers. It will say employees might even say contractors in some circumstances. When we do show, uh, show insurance, uh, we include um, uh, purveyors of, of, of food. Uh, they're automatically covered by the policy, even though we do ask that they get a certificate of insurance regardless, because we want to be able to defer as much liability away from the bad hot dogs that we all eat at horse shows as much as we can. But um, uh, so those things are defined in the policy document. This is not an ambiguous Mike King sort of, sort of definition. These things are actually defined in the work in the, in the document. Uh, for anybody on the call, if you have a show of policy with us and you have a specific question on a category of persons that might be at the event and you want to confirm their coverage, email me and I'll give you a very official document that makes it very clear that they are or they are not. I suspect that everybody that we've discussed today in this webinar are covered, frankly, quite regularly and automatically uh, because, again, we understand that the scope of risk goes well beyond that one person whose name is on the show permit, uh, that it involves an army of people to put on a successful event and that they should not be excluded. The only time we, we try and push back is when they are contractors. So as much as I've said food vendors, often it'll be a volunteer barbecue. Uh, the show group gets together and they decide that they're going to sell hamburgers and hot dogs off the grill and provide coffee that they got from Timmy's, charge a few bucks for it, and to, to, uh, to perpetuate the show for next year. Well, of course they should be provided coverage by the show policy. Very different from someone having a catering company come and do the VIP tent and do uh, potentially a service for alcohol or beverage or what other uh, things might be at a, at a bigger show. We want those folks to have their own insurance. Uh, so that again, we're deferring liability back down to that contract service provider to the best of our ability, because they're corporate entities. They should have insurance, goodness knows. This is not a burden to them. They would typically be asked to provide those documents wherever they go and wherever they provide service. Okay, uh, another question here. As a club official, 
event planner, does our regular Capri insurance through HCBC cover all our events and volunteers or hired clinician judge? We also always buy the management insurance offered. Is this helpful also? Well, to the first question, the answer is yes. Our club policy recognizes that the organization and operation of events is a, is a very usual occurrence for clubs. And it doesn't have to be the FEI discipline. So we've got lots of clubs uh, in BC and elsewhere that are small saddle clubs that do all kinds of multi-purpose events or, or multi-class um, uh, uh, events, uh, general purpose events and so on. And uh, as long as they've been disclosed that you organize and operate horse shows on the application each year, then those shows are covered. And again, those automatic extensions uh, from uh, volunteers and officials and so forth are named on the policy, not by name, individual name, but rather by category of duties that would be, other, that would be typically uh, provided to the event. And uh, those people are automatically protected by the policy. Directors and officers liability insurance is very different. Directors and officers liability insurance is provided to the board, uh, the actual people that are uh, part of that not-for-profit society or incorporated entity, whatever it may be, registered society for their uh, administrative responsibilities uh, that don't, doesn't cover bodily injury or property damage claims but frankly covers something we call wrongful act. And that is a legal term that is defined in the policy. And a wrongful act is, is something that a board member in their official duties uh, didn't do that they should have done in their official duties uh, or, or did do that they shouldn't have done. And so the example we often use is, and it's sort of relevant to a horse show. So let's, uh, let's do this. Um, let's say the club decides that they're going to have a big show next September. And because it was a COVID year, they decide early to just start doing some fundraising so they can have a really robust show next September. So they start their fundraising campaign across the community. And for the sake of discussion, they raise 10 grand. And um, uh, that 10 grand is, is in theory been provided by people donating so that this can be a great horse show and that they're going to give some of this money back through uh, prize money and they're going to have awards and they're going to do all kinds of jazz. And then Instead of doing that, instead of doing that, the board decides that they're going to take the 10 grand and buy a truck. And I'm being facetious, but they decide to allocate that money to some other purpose. Can't do it, guys. Uh, now, all of a sudden, the board's on exposing themselves to having done something that, quite frankly, is a wrongful act. They have uh, misappropriated the funds. They have misrepresented the purpose in gathering the funds and can be held legally responsible for the return of those funds. Or another example, they forget to file their CRA filings annually and lose their not-for-profit status, which forces the club into dis, dis, uh, dis, to be dismantled. Or the, the, the board is dissolved uh, and people can't participate the way that they would like to have, uh, have participated. All of those things are official duties that the board has that are defined in bylaws and in the constitution of the organization. And uh, it's those responsibilities that a director's and officer's liability policy protects. The directors and officers of the club are also protected under the directors, uh, excuse me, under the general liability policy. But DNO coverage is something we now call management liability in an effort to try and separate these exposures that might be shared by one individual. So the president uh, still has that commercial general liability exposure, but also has that fiduciary responsibility for making sure that the board does what it's supposed to do in their official duties. Okay, and then Ellen just wanted some clarification on Melanie's last question. Um, she asked about her husband needing insurance to help her at the horse shows. Um, but I think that's, I just wanna clarify. Um, if he's holding her horse and handling the horse at horse shows and helping out, assisting her that way, the horse council insurance we Definitely would want right. that still not yeah. be. Yeah, absolutely. No, listen, and, we, and we, look, we, we, we've always said this, but we want everybody that's ever going to touch a horse to be a member of Horse Council. Um, and, and certainly it does a whole bunch of things by doing that. And it's not just about the liability insurance, but also the accident insurance, which is called upon more frequently, frankly, over, over each year. Um, and uh, so in the case of Melanie's husband, God forbid, if he was kicked by somebody's horse or uh, kicked by Melanie's horse, uh, or some other thing, he'd be able to rely upon that AD and D policy. Or if it was he that was holding the horse that got away, that ran over my wife, and I decide to sue, I'm going to sue Melanie because she owns the horse, whether she was president or not. 
present or not, but I'm also going to sue Melanie's husband because he was holding the horse. And in all of those circumstances, the horse council policy will respond. Okay, perfect. And then uh, Susan just had her hand up, so. Take it and, away, uh, Susan. Yeah, I'm good. <laughs> Uh, thank, thanks, Jocelyn, and, and thanks, Mike, and welcome, everybody. I was a few minutes late, and I see a lot of names I recognize across so many disciplines and, I think, outside our province, which is wonderful. Um, so just uh, um, going back to something that Melanie mentioned as a, being an official, but in a capacity of doing an officials-type clinic, uh, improve your eye or, or however, with especially with dressage, but it can happen in the equitation as well, um, you know, a, a coach will bring in uh, an official a, a equitation judge to uh, watch some rounds and give some feedback. And in a situation like that, um, some, I'm going to say some of us are getting to an age and stage uh, where we might not, even with a, a first aid certification historically, really be the most appropriate person to be jumping in and making some of those decisions. But if you're organizing the clinic yourself or you're hired by someone to provide that service, um, this a risk management approach would possibly be that there's a designated um, EMT or first aid designated person who is that designated person in that event. Would that support your notion? So you wouldn't necessarily require it to, for the official to get insurance, but it would be part of a best practices or Something it would be part would... of that. To, to your point, Susan, of course, and, and, and that's that's a very logical and, and, and reasonable approach. So my my follow up to that is Capri has a wonderful risk management manual that has been around for some time and is still accessible and available, I think, through our website. Yep. Um, and and a lot a lot of the scenarios or the questions he, here can be answered. I think the best thing that this webinar can do is the anecdotes that you share with us that give us those visuals and those hands-on experience opportunities to know where where this you know look using this risk management could have prevented this and I think that is is key but but that risk management manual resource can help a lot um, in trying to sort of sort your way through if am I doing the best I can with the situation I'm in. And, and even the COVID, all the guidelines, you know, for competitions now to, for those COVID police and stewards, I think there's a lot of helpful information there. And, and we hope to be able to kind of guide people in that direction um, through Sandy and, and through our website to, to find those resources to, to help navigate all of this. But thank yeah. you, thank you. Yeah, and, and listen, it's 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 a it's a work in progress, Susan, and, and I know you contributed to it however many years ago, uh, like so many across the country, and a lot of it still rings absolutely true. Uh, it doesn't matter whether the, the the anecdotes are twenty years old or five years old. Um, the anecdotes are the same. Um, it's about this interaction with horses. It's about congregation of people and gatherings and crowded spaces and the unpredictability of this thousand pound critter that we all purport to love. And um, it's, it's just about recognizing that those risks are real. And gone are the days where we can sort of write it off. Uh, we can't. Um, there are, again, respectfully to the legal profession, but there are lots of lawyers that make their very good livings out of making sure that bodily injury claims find their way to courts and that insuring companies uh, 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 respond. Uh, sometimes we think they're frivolous, um, you know, and, and it's, it's just how it is. We're in 2020, almost 2021, and and by golly, uh, frivolous claims. Just my gosh, we're we're so close to having legislation in this country that will, that will just disallow that altogether. I would suspect within the next decade we will have such legislation, just as they do in many of the United States, um, where frankly, if you're involved with horses, if you want to if you want to uh, uh, willingly participate in equine activity, you can't sue. Period. It's part it's part of the deal. Uh, state law says you can't, or if you die as a direct result of an equine interaction, the most you can get, even if there's gross, I shouldn't say gross, if there is negligence proved, 100 grand, 50 grand, 10 grand, or zero, uh, that in other words, it's pretty hard in some jurisdictions to ignore the big brown beast. 
I mean, what do you mean? You thought it was a puppy? Like, did you not understand that their horse's head weighs as much as a full grown man or more? Um, and so uh, we're just not there yet in Canada. Uh, fortunately, we haven't had so many claims of, that it's been forced or pushed by insurers, at least in the horse industry. But there's no question as I read trade stuff every morning as part of my, my wake up, there's no question the liability claims are becoming more frequent, uh, the judgments are getting higher, and um, that um, those two are drivers for higher insurance costs or, or potentially uh, restricted availability for coverages. And we're in a very specialized class, I want to tell everybody here, uh, if you consider all the insuring companies, not brokers like me, but insuring companies in the country, couple of hundred of them, maybe. Uh, how many do you think will even entertain? I mean, even consider risks associated with equine, uh, under 20. How many would even do it on a commercial basis? Under five. So our options as an industry are pretty limited and it's not for any other reason than frankly, uh, our community is not so huge. And so uh, it's hard for us as brokers often to get a bunch of choices and a bunch of things that we can manipulate to address customer need. Uh, we're often bound by a very restrictive market. And at the moment, with COVID and other economic pressures, insurers around the world are, are contracting. There's all kinds of uh, mergers and acquisitions. Royal Insurance, a name that probably many of you know, is about to be absorbed. Another mega organization about to be absorbed by Intact. There's another business. There's another opportunity for choice and capacity and capital that'll disappear. And that's happening all over the world. And uh, so much of our risk in equine goes to Lloyd's of London. And Susan and I have talked about this ad nauseum, but for those that don't know, Lloyd's of London is not a single carrier. It's a number of syndicates of capital that provide the coverage for all of us around the world to, to, uh, to uh, uh, tie into. Those, the number of syndicates at Lloyd's has been shrinking over the last decade to the point now where it's about a third of what it was 10 years ago. And what that means, again, consolidation of capital, consolidation of underwriting appetite, it puts a lot of pressure on industry generally, and for specialty industries like ours, immense pressure. So we are very keen to make sure we tamp down risk at every opportunity, which is why these sessions are so important, and for people to take this stuff very seriously. Because I hate to think of a day when I have to come back to a seminar like this and say, okay, Melanie, you know that policy you paid 250 bucks for? Now it's 2,500 and that's the best we can do, which shuts down the industry because nobody's gonna do that. So it's all very important. We have to remember, always be diligent and proactive in trying to mitigate risk. Okay, a question from Melissa. Uh, in the circumstance of a volunteer holding the horse at a, of a competitor and the horse runs a Mac, the show insurance would cover the volunteer or would that be considered outside the volunteer's job? And he would have to rely on his personal HCBC. Um, they had a question with their group if the volunteer should be required to have HCBC. Well, it, it would depend so much on, on what the circumstances of the, of the incident were. Um, you know, was the volunteer acting as a volunteer when they were holding my horse? I would say not. They weren't hired by the show as a volunteer or they weren't engaged by the, the show to be a volunteer to hold my horse, I would doubt. Um, so I would say it would depend very much on the, on the facts of the, or the circumstances of that incident, whether or not the individual holding the horse was doing so as, as, a, as my agent, as the owner of the horse, or as the agent of the uh, show as a volunteer and their official duties as a volunteer that we would ask very clearly to be defined after the claim occurred. Uh, somebody way smarter than me would pick up the phone and say, so show organizer, can you define the role of that particular volunteer when you engage them to be a part of the show. And that would dictate what the coverage is. Okay, um, and then Linda has a question. As an organizer, is there going to be any forward movement from coaching to have only certified coaches on site at shows? Well, isn't that an interesting topic? Nice segue. Um, as recently as two hours ago, I was on a call uh, and there will be lots of information coming from EC and from Horse Council, I'm guessing over the next couple of weeks about uh, this whole notion of licensing and, and what EC is going to do to, um, to try and um, move that file forward. But suffice to say, there is movement forward on that file. Um, and I don't want to, I'm not trying to be evasive, um, but I would, I, I don't want to, I don't want to get ahead of what their official uh, uh, 
um, sort of announcements might be, because they're still very much a work in progress. Um, our involvement uh, has to do from a risk management advice perspective. And we've done some things that we think are important to try and move that file along in a meaningful way. Um, I think what I would say uh, to, the call, to the people on the call is this, that um, Equestrian Canada has this, this, this challenge, and I'm not defending them, nor am I supporting them particularly, but it's just a recognition of their role in the community. And um, Justice Horse Council is the pointy end of the stick in, in British Columbia um, uh, and, and receives that designation uh, from ministers of sport, minister of Agri agriculture and tourism, and all the, the, the government bodies that have to designate sport organizations in the province of British Columbia. So too is the case for Equestrian Canada as the national sport authority. So they're the pointy end of the stick for the entire equine industry. Whether or not they're actively participating in the day-to-day -day operations of things outside of FEI disciplines is another debate, which I won't try and get into. But, but the reality is the minister of sport and the ministers federally recognize only Equestrian Canada as the pointy end of the stick for the entire industry. So they have an obligation in that role to uh, not only report to the ministers so that they can continue to receive funding, which is diminishing all the time, but nonetheless receive funding for the propagation of sport, which is not just about going to the Olympic games, but includes that, which is not just about running sanctioned events, but includes that, but it's just as much about active participation in athleticism across society in general. That's also within their responsibility. They do that with partnerships with BC Horse Council and other PSOs to try and deliver grassroots programming. But they're not seen as that. They're only seen as sort of the sanctioning event or the sanctioning body up here. But their role is much broader than that federally and much broader than that technically. So the licensing component, back to my point eventually, the licensing component is part of their mandate um, as dictated by the minister. They didn't decide that licensed coaches were only those, or, or that, that, that only licensed coaches could be at horse shows. That wasn't EC's decision. The Minister of Sports said, coaches that are participating at sanctioned events across all sport will eventually need to be credentialed so that we can protect the athlete. That's what the mandate is. There was all kinds of um, agreements entered into between the federal minister and all NSOs across all amateur sport. And Susan, you're much more an expert in this than I am. Uh, but these sorts of uh, structures uh, occur not only in BC under safe sport program protocols, but they also occur federally. So EC, Equestrian Canada, is doing their job. They are purveying, they are delivering a message from the minister to eventually achieve uh, a credential as being a minimum standard for coaches to be in a relationship with an athlete. What that credential will include is everything from safe sport training. This is not rocket science. Every coach should have that. Background checks to make sure that they're not bad people. Um, uh, and other sort of basic trainings that say for a coach to be in that relationship with an athlete, they have had those background checks. They have had that continuing education. They've had that professional development to which they should be considered credentialed or licensed. I don't like the word licensed. I made that very clear to EC and everybody else that'll listen. I think it's a, it's, a, it's a big stick sort of thing. I prefer the term credentialed, but the theory is the same. The, the end result is the same. The ultimate objective is for this sport to be elevated, to be better than it is today, better than it was a decade ago. So that when coaches hang out their shingle and say, I'm gonna teach your kid how to ride, the general consumer, the general public can have some trust in a credential having been achieved for that individual to be in that relationship with my kid, with my wife, with me. And I don't think that that's something that we should walk away from. I think we should embrace it, even with all its warts, all its bumps and all the, the hassles that are coming out of this discussion. But eventually this is the standard. You wouldn't send your child to swimming lessons if the coach wasn't certified or that there wasn't a lifeguard on the deck. Why in heaven's name would you send your child to a barn where the coach isn't credentialed? It doesn't make any sense to me. I'm a parent and a grandparent, and I sure as hell wouldn't. And I hope others follow that lead. So there's my little bit about licensing. Hope that wasn't too long. Thank okay, you. I think that's it for questions, unless anybody has anything else.
Okay, great. So thanks, Mike. Yeah, thanks, sure, Mike. We did um, it in under hour. <laughs> so, Doc, Jocelyn. Yeah. Hi, sorry, I, I had my hand up. Just one more, uh, and just as a segue to everything Mike has said, the fact that that we're all here today. Um, oh my. Hello. Are you still there? Oh, I said a bad word. Um, um, it, it just goes to show that we're 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 here because we've participated. We're buying in, and we're either licensed or we're insured or running events. And I thank everybody for being here. We don't want to be a big pointy stick, but we do value the opportunity to provide some education, <laughs> share some best practices, and and help everybody find a way forward through all of this. And, you know, we don't generate a lot of revenue from licensed officials and sanctioned competitions, but we hope to invite the participation by providing the opportunity to be licensed to have sanctioning so that um, we can all carry on with part participating in a meaningful way. So I just wanted to sort of tie it all together that having insurance is, and access to it is is important and valued and and mike is is great at at keeping us educated but our hope is never to have to use it and yeah. hopefully with such education and programming um we can spread the word and and bring people on side so that th that the best practices become the focus and and uh, and if it's under the guise of insurance and that's the only way people get to, to hear the, the good words, then so be it. But um, Sandy will be quite happy to, to you know, provide people with those opportunities to answer questions about club activities and, and officials and upgrading and, and education and, um, and all the rest of it. So, you know, thanks to everybody for participating and, and, um, and thanks again, Mike, for, for all you've been doing. It's all good. Happy to be here. And, and uh, if other questions come up, guys, I've got email everywhere and, and everybody at Horse Council knows how to get me. So if you've got questions you didn't want to ask in a big public forum, by all means, reach out. We've got a great team and, and uh, I'm here to help and, and we're going to move forward. Next year is going to be a great year. It's going to be a different year. We're not going back to anything. I want to say that one more time. We're going to go to something different and, uh, and it's going to be very good. I'm, I'm absolutely confident in that. So anyway. I'll say goodbye to that. And uh, thanks very much for having me, uh, Horse Council. I appreciate it every time. Thanks, Mike. That was uh, really informative. Thanks very much. Um, yeah. Thanks, everyone, for coming. And again, if you have any questions, any more questions, you can reach out to Mike. You can uh, email competition at hcbc.ca and we'll forward any questions to him. Also, this has been recorded and it will be on the website. Um, within a couple of days. So we'll let everybody know if you wanna, you know, go back and review anything uh, from what was discussed today. So thanks again, everybody, and have a great rest of your afternoon. Bye. Bye